private events. So I look forward to, you know, you have a great time today and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, and we're having a, we're having a little contest over there. I think it's um, yeah we have the, the so basically anyone who comes over there and signs up to be a member of her wine society, which doesn't cost anything. You don't even have to get wine shipped to you. But all the people that want to become members tonight are entered in a raffle to win a really nice bottle of French champagne. What is it, JCB? It's called JCB number. Okay, so it's a vintage champagne, so that's pretty cool. And then on top of that, um, everyone who comes over and puts their card in the Web Clicquot bucket, I just have to find where the Web Clicquot bucket is, it's over there uh, somewhere. Um, we're gonna draw a winner tonight, or, or John's gonna draw a winner tonight, and the winner is gonna get a really nice bottle of uh, Cabernet or, or something. We, we, we brought a lot of wine, so. We're gonna we're gonna do that too. So um, and you know, let me just give you a quick overview of Crypto Monday. So I started this two years ago in San Francisco. A friend of mine in New York started the first one. It was a meetup. People talked about stuff, and I believed that in the Bay Area, people want content. People want engagement. People want community, not community like we find on places like Facebook. <laughs> no, that's not community, is it? Is it? No. Boo. No, like human, normal interaction, right? And that seemed to be something for me from the East Coast that I found surprisingly lacking here um, on the West Coast. I just don't find people being that open to meet new people and engage and talk about stuff, which just seems kind of weird, but just kind of the way it seemed to me. So um, we started Crypto Mondays with the idea of bringing together really interesting content and enabling people from total newbies to super pros to all get together, learn from each other, try stuff out, grow their networks, and, and that's kind of how this began. And um, we kind of believe that if we enable really interesting uh, conversations and meetings with, with the type of people that you read about, literally, the type of people that you don't get to sit down and talk to, and enable that conversation in an intimate setting, and throw a little wine in the mix, we get some really cool, immersive, fun experiences, right? And that's for me, personally, that's why I do this. I find it very fulfilling to see a room full of people having a good time learning and that sort of thing. So that's kind of why we do this. We hope you have fun. And uh, without further ado, let me find if Fredo. Fredo, are you here? Yeah. Fredo. And our host from Arson Forrester, Fredo, will tell us a little bit about what they're up to. Thank you. is a full service law firm. Uh, we're in this building on six or seven floors. We've got our wonderful town hall and beautiful views. Uh, we have offices in 17 key uh, commercial locations around the world and represent public companies and private companies and investors and other clients in a range of legal needs uh, from litigation to patent prosecution to uh, IP strategy, trademark, uh, financing, investments, M&A, um, and a lot of different regulatory areas across a lot of different sectors, um, including blockchain. We have a blockchain and smart contracts group. Uh, the co-chairs are in uh, New York and DC, focusing on blockchain and A deals, and uh, as well as regulatory issues that they deal with in DC. I'm kind of like their co-host guy here in San Francisco, which is why someone said, hey, Fredo, will you talk to these guys at Crypto Monday? And I said, sure. Um, I do a lot of advising uh, Lisa on some of their investments and thinking in that space, as well as other clients. I actually was flying to Switzerland Bitcoin Suisse across everything and all over the place. I just I literally just closed a deal with my clients, uh, which is pretty fun. So um, in addition to me doing blockchain, uh, I actually focus and uh, has a scale up blog on a website that has resources for startup people that are entrepreneurs or interested in investing in startups. Uh, it's got you know forms and things to, to incorporate your companies and look at and see what's market, as well as uh, news and stuff and up to date trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. And that's our local scale up. Um, we also provide our clients with a lot of advice on privacy and data security, which I mentioned because of course that's why I want to here in the solicitation. I do uh, we're market leaders in that area. Uh, do a lot of work on CCPA and GDPR, uh, given our presence in both uh, California and uh, Europe. I'm those two biggest laws that are in the space. 
work with our clients through talking to regulators to make sure they don't get in trouble in the first place and also litigating them out of the trouble. Um, and they're thought leaders on, uh, basically on, on cybersecurity and publish a lot about that, both uh, cybersecurity as well as data privacy laws on our website. There's a privacy blog that we have that links to a lot of information, including links to the laws of at least 100 different regulatory countries um, and their privacy regulations. So I invite you to pick up some of the literature on your way out about our blockchain group and our privacy group. And uh, talk to any of those folks that uh, did that work if you ever need questions or if you want to talk to me, you can reach me at asilva at mofo.com. That's asilva at mofo.com. And I'll now turn on that. Back over to you, Mark. Thanks, everyone. It is at Alfredo. Uh, <laughs> now, Fredo, is your name originally Italian? Venezuela. Okay, Venezuela. Okay. I don't know if there's good wine in Venezuela. But in any case, Fredo, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a ping after and if you're still around. Come on back because our experience, the last two wine events we had, is that no one wants to leave. They just want to hang out and have a good time. So you know what? I think we'll be kind of social. And again, a huge thanks to Mofo um, for making this happen, and for Fredo and his team for making this happen. And uh, by the way, I've actually used their online resources, and there's a ton of great free information there. You know, you can use to help you know vet how you build a company, partner agreements. It's a great place to start. Uh, my first startup, uh, GigX, we use them out of their LA office and everything was awesome. So, thank you very much. Now I want to introduce to you the man who's, because of this, we're all having a great time with drinking wine, Mr. John Jeffries from CypherTrace, who's going to tell us what CypherTrace is really all about and why it's really cool. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all. Thank you, Brittany, for uh, showing up and uh, putting on a great show. And Explaining to us your journey. Uh, I'm John Jeffries from Cypherface for a blockchain. Our goal is really to help the economy by making it safe and as possible to help prevent illicit actors operating on the different exchanges so that we can all offer and buy in this new space. We have worked and worked very closely with regulators and law enforcement to try to make sure that. The economy is safe at the same time. We try to help educate uh, the regulators <laughs> such that they uh, pass as sensible laws as possible. Um, and we spend a lot of time in DC with different working groups um, working with them to try to help uh, work through some of these rules. One of the specific rules that we have a lot of energy on, which may, many folks may not be aware of, is the so called travel rule. Ooh. Which uh, is, you know, has the potential to be extremely detrimental to user privacy. Um, unfortunately, it's a done deal, so whatever we may choose to think about it, uh, you choose to think, but uh, the thing that we're trying to do is we've released an open source solution where we hope to imbue privacy into the travel rules such that your PII, what this rule requires is that exchanges on either side pass both the recipient and the sender information every transaction over over a thousand dollars which uh, is not just a, a privacy issue but it's just a security issue given the sec ops that some exchanges uh, onshore and offshore have so it presents a real exposure point for most of our private information and so we're hoping that this initiative that we call trisa uh, will help to protect that so we had an open source uh, release a couple weeks ago we had an event where we had people working on various different options uh, to avoid the passing of this PII, uh, such that you can pass tokens or use zero knowledge proofs to enable compliance without the transfer and transmittal of PII. So, while on the surface of it, a blockchain analytics company may not appear to be a company that would uh, imbue privacy, both the founder and myself uh, were both original cypherpunks, and privacy is very core to the vision of the company and we think to the ethos of the community. So. Uh, we also have some solutions. Uh, so like I said, we do forensics, so we help uh, trace uh, illicit activities, drug dealers, uh, terrorists, other sorts of activities like that. We help with anti-money laundering. We work with various different uh, jurisdictions to help create a safe sandbox to help them get their exchange to banks. So we work with Bermuda and Malta to provide a secure infrastructure for them. And we also help banks understand their potential risk exposure because 
uh, whether or not they you know they're actually getting ripped off. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, that's what we do. Don't want to take too much time, but thank you for coming out. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me or Jackie is over there and Paul uh, from Cypher Trace. I can answer any questions you might have. But no further ado, let's bring it on the start. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. And uh, real quick, I want to introduce you to one more person, um, my friend Alicia from Starfish Mission. Alicia, all right. Jeff and Alicia, what is up, Jeff? All right. Um, Starfish Mission, for those of you guys who don't know, has become the de facto place for a lot of blockchain companies to go work and we're having events all the time. And they were kind enough to be community partners with us to help promote this event. We originally were going to do it there, but um, it ended up that this was just too awesome for a venue, so we had to do it here first. But we're going to do a bunch of stuff with them, so here we go. Uh, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Alicia. I founded Starfish. Um, this is Jeff. What's going on, everybody? I'm Jeff. I run operations for Starfish. And uh, we're super excited to support the event. And um, yeah, we shared this in our community. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces here. So thank you for being here. Um, just a little bit about Starfish. So we are a uh, co-working space, event production uh, company, and a startup incubator. We're based in the mid-market area in San Francisco. We have over 40 companies that are based out of the space mostly focused on blockchain, emerging tech, and um, IoT. And uh, yeah, we produce a lot of events. Uh, we call it as a blockchain week recently. And um, yeah, data privacy is something that we really care about. <laughs> so I'm super excited to support. If you want, want to learn more about us, uh, can we go back to the other slide? It's OK. Um, just go to starfishcommunity.com or come and talk to me or Jeff. Yeah, you know, whatever your role is in the community, whether you're a developer, an investor, or just kind of uh, naive to the space, we're always looking to expand our mentor network in our community. So feel free to stop by. We're right at 1535 Mission. So Jeff, Jeff and Isha, I'm, just a little, I'm just a little curious. So I remember Starfish is Starfish Mission. But now I see the Starfish community. Did the mission name go away and you guys are a community or? So uh, Starfish, so we're Starfish. Um, I think we decided to promote Starfish community a bit more just to emphasize the fact that it's a global community of founders and builders. And Starfish Mission is the name of the space or from HQ. So yeah, it's on Mission Street. So <laughs> yeah, just to clarify. So yeah, if anyone's looking for an office or wants to do an event, help us. And, and the great part about this is that um, because of the wine, I'm sure all you guys are going to be hanging out later. So yeah, but one more thing, <laughs> one more thing that um, I want to yeah, get up. Woo! Yes, that's it! Yeah! Yes! Woo! Um, you might have seen these things on your seats. Now, these are important for a number of reasons. Number one, we take these feedback forms really seriously. So if we get all ones, then we know we fucked up and we're doing a crummy job. If we get all tens, then we're really happy. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, but seriously, what we're really interested in is your feedback. And we also try to understand a little bit who our audience is, how to program for our audience. You know, so if you wouldn't mind giving us a little info about yourself, what your role is, et cetera, et cetera, that would be great. And then also, this is your entry form for the free bottle of wine, okay? So if you don't have your name down here, um, your name and your email or your name and your phone, you're not entered to win. So all you gotta do, so think about this right now. Look under your chair, take it from the chair next to you, pick this up, put it on your lap, and I know I've been so awesome, you can already start giving great um, great feedback probably before you can hear Brittany. Just kidding. Um, but so if you fill this in and then find the little red web clico uh, thing that's right behind Brittany, yes, find that little web clico um, uh, cooler thing, drop it in there with your information on it, and John is going to pull a winner and we're going to give away a nice bottle of wine afterwards. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to a futurist, a haver of big ideas, a journalist, 
a woman who has had her face literally plastered on the building next to the Moscone Center, Ms. Ann Ward. <laughs> Take it away. Stage is yours. Thank you, Brittany. Come join me. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for our sponsors and hosts. Uh, Brittany and I met last year, we worked together briefly, where I got to know the magic and the thunder that is Brittany Heiser. <laughs> and uh, I'm so excited to sit down and have this amazing conversation with her. We have very full glasses of wine, thanks to Mark. And so, uh, Thank you, Mark. In Veritas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you are tweeting, if you're an avid tweeter like me, please use uh, hashtag SFCryptoMonday. Can you guys hear us? Now first, guys, this is like, we have like the first lady of blockchain in the room, okay? And Brittany not only is like super well known for all the stuff she's written, all the whistleblowing she's done, all the cool stuff she's doing, but let's just give Brittany a warm San Francisco welcome and thank her for coming here tonight. by this room right now. I'm so excited to be here and the fact that this materialized so incredibly quickly. Come on, yes to Mark and all of our sponsors and hosts. Thank you guys so much for making this happen. <laughs> at, at the drop of a hat, really. Um, and I, I'm so pleased to be sitting with one of my favorite people to have what, what you guys should know is both a public conversation and basically a catch up because we haven't seen each other in quite a few months and Privacy, data management, data protection, and blockchain are our favorite topics, and this is what we would talk about if we were having a private dinner <laughs> after not seeing each other for very many months and talking about what we've been up to and what we think are the biggest world issues right now that a lot of people in this room are helping solve. And that's why we wanted to bring you all together for this conversation this evening, because we know this room is filled with lawyers and technologists and policymakers and activists and people who are helping solve a lot of the problems that we're going to be talking about. So thank you guys for being here. Woo! Yes. Cheers to you! Cheers. The yeah. you Absolutely. <laughs> well, so how many of you in the room, just so I have a feel for how geeky we are, how many of you own crypto? No. <laughs> nice. All right, so I'll start with software. <laughs> so, Brittany, should policies that allow you to erase your data require AI models that data flows into to be new trained. Just a side. <laughs> Obviously. And so I think that <laughs> this is something that a lot of blockchain companies are grappling with right now because a lot of the reasons why blockchain companies have built our solutions is because originally we, we believe in transparency. We believe in immutability. So how are you going to deal with both issues of making sure that data is never erased and also being GDPR compliant for the right to delete. And also having the ethical guidelines of giving people the right to delete for reasons that they should be able to claim as perhaps their basic human right. And that's an issue right now. What, what data are we going to put immutably on the blockchain that is going to be there forever? And what are we going to choose to protect? And how are we going to protect that data? And I think definitely there are going to be certain data points and certain data that we create on a day-to-day -day basis that perhaps we shouldn't put mutably on the blockchain. Certainly different parts of PII, personally identifiable information, should sometimes be exempted from transactions to make sure if someone has a reason to ask for the right to delete, and there are many reasons, both legal, policy, and ethically, that people can ask for the right to delete these days, that they should be able to do that. So holding off the data points from certain algorithms, yes, I think right now that we have to, and that's what the lawmakers and the policymakers are asking us to do. Exactly, and I think that's, without that, what are we doing? So you said, you said it beautifully, but I think while we're on that topic, 
you know, you're known for the owner data. You're known for so many things, but I think that's one thing that uh, a lot of people care about these days. So, how does, in, you know, somewhat layman terms, because we have a lot of pros here, uh, how does blockchain help you own your data? Right. So, I think in order to describe that, it's best to kind of take a few steps back and talk about what does data ownership mean. Now, there's data ownership on a technology level and there's data ownership on a legal and policy level. So if we're talking about legal, a lot of people say that uh, privacy is a human right and data rights should be human rights. Yes, one of your human rights is not only your right to privacy, but your right to own property. And the property rights framework is something that I continue to drum on about because I believe it is the only way that in a future that is completely digital and in a future where almost everything we produce on a, on a daily basis, different asset classes, not just our data, but also our blockchain tokens, our digital assets, if we don't start to use a property rights framework, then we're going to lose our legal recourse to protect our most valuable assets. So let, let me put it in a very basic way. When we're talking about managing our data and giving people access to our data, the way I like to think about it is an Airbnb model. So if I put my house as my property on Airbnb and somebody wants to use or have access to my property, they're going to tell me who they are. They're going to tell me what they want to do with my property for how long they want to use it and we're gonna agree on a price and they're gonna pay before I hand away the keys. Why can't our data, <laughs> thank you to the other cowboy hat in there. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, why, why can't our data be like that? And I really think we're moving towards a future where our data will be like that. Because in 2017, The Economist said that data is now the world's most valuable asset. Data what we produce every day, our most valuable asset that we are contributing as a human, every single day that we're producing, every moment, is now more valuable than oil and gas. Yet somehow, this multi-trillion dollar industry, we as the producers of this asset, we do not have legal rights to that value that we're producing, which is something that is quite archaic. No longer are we allowed to show up on someone's land and start pumping it for oil and think that we can run away without compensating the owners of that land. That's where we're at right now in terms of companies and governments using their power in order to extract our value and not actually giving us value in return. So when we talk about how are we going to manage data ownership with a blockchain, we need to really think about all of those different mechanisms. How do we protect the value that we produce? How do we manage that value? And how do we also monetize it in a way that makes sense and also protects people? Right, but you know, another specific instance I always think about is a dentist. Uh, because <sighs> cry me a river on what, what happens when your identity gets pulled online. I do weird things because I'm that kind of a person. Uh, Facebook thinks I'm going to I have an online birthday. I have all the sort of decoys that I use to try to confuse the models skew the data because that's my own little form of anarchy. So I think that the reason that we have so many people in poverty is that they're unbanked. And I think that blockchain represents an opportunity to actually help alleviate human suffering and these other things. And so, you know, I think it's an uphill battle for many reasons, right? Absolutely. Usability, you know, there's no trust. Hey, the warlords are taking everything we have. Why should we trust you? A retina scan is terrifying to a lot of people. Right. So, what do you see emerging as solutions in order to solve that piece? So, obviously, solving issues of trust is something that a lot of you guys work on every single day. And I'm not going to be claim, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on how we instill trust in individuals. But I can tell you from all of the work that I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis, from working with children and parents and teachers to working with legislators and policymakers and brands and consumers, every single person is having a similar conversation on what should be our guidelines on transparency, what should be our guidelines on consent. 
and then how do we actually enable people to be digitally literate enough to make their own informed, consensual decisions. And that's where, where we're at right now. Um, I'd really like to get a show of hands on how many people read the terms and conditions the last time you downloaded an app. I skimmed. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so those terms and conditions are specifically written to manipulate you. They're written to be in legalese, which is what uh, is considered lawyers speak. It's written in terminology that the common person cannot understand or should not understand if the brand is going to achieve what they're trying to do. Which is to get you to agree to give away a lot more data and give access to different pockets of data and different parts of your device that will give them access to more data than you would if you were properly informed. And that's the truth. Uh, so, a lot of the conversation right now around transparency is, okay, how much have we already been manipulated to give away? And I'm sorry to say that most of us have already given away everything. <laughs> if you look at the terms and conditions that you have recently signed, you have signed away access to all of your contacts, all the data that you produce in all of your other apps, access to your phone uh, camera, as well as your microphone, at any time that that app decides to turn it on. And so when you see, I would call it disinformation in the press where Facebook says accidentally, we have had access to some people's cameras every now and then and we didn't mean to. Oopsie. <laughs> no, you signed a contract giving them access to that. It's a contract. So how many times would you ever show up to your desk and see a pile of paper contracts and spend all day flipping to the last page and signing it. I'm moving it over, flipping to the last page and signing it. That's what you do all day long when you accept cookies from every web page that you go to, when you download apps and just automatically tick the T's and C's box and you don't read them. You are signing contracts without reading them all day long and you have no idea what you're agreeing to, but, but that's the point. Well, so wouldn't the counterpoint to that be though, you are getting and enjoying these beautiful products for free. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So, Absolutely. you know, your server space, they've got to pay for their employee. How do you expect, <laughs> how do you expect these companies to survive? Or is it perhaps maybe the models are broken? See, this is a, a big misnomer in, in my opinion, where a lot of companies think that in order to be ethical and respectful, you have to break your business model. Why are we in a world that thinks like that? That's a, that's a disaster. Uh, that, that, that's terrible. Um, so if you think about the business model right now, yes, you are monetizing people's data most of the time in order to achieve a lot of your financial goals as a company. Sure. How are you getting to the point where you are monetizing people's data? Now, I think if anyone in this room has any idea of what a data science program looks like, you know that the majority of the money is spent purchasing and licensing data sets from companies all around the world. That takes an insane amount of money. Every year, sometimes every day, every week, every month, every quarter, depending on how often you pay for refreshes, and then you're paying Mostly PhD holding data scientists and data engineers that have been doing this since they were born to spend their IQ matching and hygiening all these data sets that you've acquired from all around the world. And you actually have someone that's been at university for a decade to learn how to do this, trying to figure out whether the five data sets on me that say I'm female, 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 male, male, am I a female or a male? Yet I'm in your database and you can send me an email and ask me that. <laughs> it, it, it's completely ridiculous, actually, the way that we spend our money on data science and on data targeting. I'm not against micro-targeting or using data in order to give people a better experience. Absolutely not. I really believe that data science and AI will save the world and actually solve a lot of the biggest problems that we have on the planet. But not if we can't start to use common sense and ethics in the way that we use data science. Why can't companies and brands start to talk to me as a consumer and say, hey, here's all the data that we hold on you. 
here's a bit of transparency for you. Here's all the stuff we hold on you. What is still relevant? What is true? What is not true? How about you hygiene it yourself and we're going to give you your next purchase for free. We're going to give you all these company points or tokens or loyalty, whatever it happens to be. These are already schemes that exist whether they're on the blockchain or not, whether it's token incentives or something else. This is already a concept that exists in terms of market research, surveys that people send out. Why don't we use that a little bit more and stop using big data aggregators that have acquired all of this data in a very non-consensual way, in a very kleptocratic way, where people are not fully informed as to where their data is going. And guess what? A lot of that data is not only old or wrong, but it's irrelevant at this point in time. If you know what is my favorite color and what's my favorite band from 10 years ago and you just paid money to buy that, I'm sorry, but I don't have the same favorite color or the same favorite band <laughs> I guess, as I did yeah. when I was in college. Exactly. So. I, I used to quite garbage and all the dresses all the time. Exactly. Like jokes on you. Uh, they're merciless spammers. But, you know, you recently said, on a more serious note, you said in the press recently that you agreed that Facebook represented a serious risk to democracy. Yes. And I would a thousand percent agree with that, but could you kind of drill down for us a little bit on why that is? And, you know, should we just give up, roll over, submit to our centralized masters? Or are, is there something we can do? What, what can we do as consumers? Well, you're speaking to someone that is an eternal optimist. <laughs> so trust me, I'm going to give you some solutions. But what, what I want you guys all to walk away with tonight, no matter how freaked out or nervous you are about some of the stuff that we discuss, I want you to walk away with the idea that you have agents. Everything that you do every single day either is a part of the solution or a part of the problem. And that's actually the truth. I mean, I, I'm sitting here without Facebook installed on my phone, but I still have WhatsApp on my Mark Zuckerberg himself. And uh, I, you know, I, I'm constantly aware of my decisions. What am I opting into every day? What am I using? Who am I deciding to vote with my dollar or my time or my attention? And you as an individual every day can do something like call your legislator which I'm sorry, but not enough of us do, because I hang out with legislators every single day and a lot of them do not receive your calls and emails, <laughs> saying that you care about data privacy Cut and you care- Cut down on your tweets, 20%. <laughs> Cut down on your cyber stalking, 10%, and call that legislator. Absolutely, you can send them a text a lot of the times, you can send them uh, an email, you can give a call in and leave a voicemail, you don't even have to have that human interaction if you're not into that. <laughs> um, you can actually just send them a message saying, these are the things that I care about. And when you are in Congress, I want you to represent me. These are the things that I care about because it's your job to represent me. And you know what it is. If enough of us actually say these are the things that we care about, there is a legal requirement that they have to do something about that. Now, how much time and how much effort they put towards these issues versus other issues is actually up to us whether we ask them to or not. So that's number one, let alone number two. Please start reading the terms and conditions, even though it's annoying. Please do okay, it. Okay, but I'm going to drink all <laughs> And you, you know what? There's a lot of requirements um, that are starting to come in that are going to actually change the way that terms and conditions are written. I don't know if you've noticed recently, but a lot of web pages when you land on them and there's a big pop-up box that comes and says whether you want to accept cookies or not you can still read the web page and if you go into more options or no I disagree to cookies guess what you still get to read the article it wasn't like that last year but it's like that now because of the pressure that we have put on the industry that says it is no longer fair consumer standards that you are going to continue to manipulate people to agree to things that they do not understand so more clear-cut terms and conditions are the way it's going to be. But I, I digressed from the Facebook is our biggest threat to democracy conversation, which is one of my favorite conversations. So I'm going to go back to that. Pretty on the record for that feeling. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, so I don't say that lightly. I mean, most of you guys probably know that I spent three and a half years of my life working at a company called Cambridge Analytica. 
which I'm sure you've heard of, which, oh, worked, <laughs> which was a data science company. We're in the political division. We had a lot of very controversial clients. Uh, not a lot. It was small compared to the, the general world populace that was served by this company. But you know, the Trump campaign and the Trump super PACs and uh, related organizations were a big part of that. And what I saw when I worked there was that people's personal data was used in ways where if you were given transparent consent mechanisms, you would have never agreed for these organizations to have your data, to use it to target you with any messaging, or to use it to persuade you to do or not do certain things. And it sounds pretty innocuous when you say it that way, like, okay, there, there's no way that that affected me. I'm not a persuadable. Well, guess what? Everyone actually is to, to a degree, but the people who are most highly persuadable, people who make snap decisions, people who maybe have certain fears around certain political ideology or issues in their day-to-day -day lives, you are more persuadable than you actually think. And the more of your data that has actually been put out there that is available for purchase or license, and you have no protection against that data being used to send you political messaging allows bad actors to get access to you directly. Bad actors to send you messaging that makes you hate your neighbor. Messaging that makes you not believe in your government. Messaging that perhaps makes you not want to go to the polls at all and vote. If anyone's felt that way over the past few years, it might not be that you actually developed that idea by yourself. It might be that you were shown messaging campaigns, articles of disinformation, paid advertising, your search results in Google being changed through people that have paid to change them in order to change your idea of how effective our government and our leaders and people who are running for office actually are. And unfortunately, that is the agenda of some of the people that currently have access to our screens. People that can put information directly in front of us where we have no ability to stop it. We have no consent or permission structures that stop that from happening. And that is real. And I saw it for myself. It's the reason why I decided to completely freak out <laughs> last March <laughs> and decide to go on a path where I had no idea where it was going to take me, but to say the entire data industry is completely corrupt. And right now we're in a situation where it's so easy for us to be taken advantage of, and it's so easy for us to not understand how bad this system has gotten. And if, if to directly address this question very specifically, I think a lot of you guys probably saw a couple of weeks ago when Mark Zuckerberg gave a speech at Georgetown University where he claimed that not policing politicians and what they say on his platform, the world's biggest advertising platform and the world's largest country community that exists, by deciding to not enforce the same community standards that Anne and I and all of you guys are held to for politicians, that that, that is a protection of free speech. You know what? Uh, I spent about 10 years in law school becoming a human rights lawyer. Free speech is not unchecked. My right to free speech ends where Anne's rights begin to protect her own human rights. Right, that's why you can't yell fire in movies. That's why you can't just yell around fire in movies. You kind of have to be less sympathetic. Absolutely. Yeah. Unless you don't Twitter. So some of the things, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I don't use Twitter. Uh, or Instagram, oh, where, where all the trolls live. Oh, well, anyway, uh, anyway, so when you start to look at the idea that politicians' speech is now being deemed newsworthy on Facebook, and therefore no one on, on Facebook that is running for political office is going to be held to the same community standards as you and I, mm -hmm. where we are not allowed to slander or, or libel someone, we are not allowed to use disinformation, we're not allowed to incite violence or hatred based off of racism or sexism or any other reason. We're not allowed to engage in voter suppression tactics 
all of these things that I've just listed are actually illegal. <laughs> there, there are laws against these things already in American law, yet somehow on Facebook they've decided that enforcing U.S. law is not interesting. A really quick question. Could we show the trailer of your amazing Netflix thing, The Great Hack? We had it queued up and I meant to show it before we started. Could we just show it? And Absolutely. Jump in there. We'll take an intermission. We'll take an intermission. All right, we're going to take a quick Great Hack intermission. Brittany, author, data evangelist, and now movie star. Here we go. Documentary subject. <laughs> Who has seen an advertisement that has convinced you that your microphone is listening to your conversations? All of your interactions, your credit card swipes, web searches, locations, likes, they're all collected in real time into a trillion dollar a year industry. The real game changer was Cambridge Analytica. They worked for the Trump campaign and for the Brexit campaign. They started using information warfare. Cambridge Analytica claimed to have 5,000 data points on every American voter. I started tracking down all these Cambridge Analytica ex-employees. Someone else that you should be calling to committee is Brittany Kaiser. Brittany Kaiser, once a key player inside Cambridge Analytica, casting herself as a whistleblower. The reason why Google, Facebook are the most powerful companies in the world is because last year data surpassed oil in value. Data is the most valuable asset on Earth. Each argument goes whose minds were thought we could change until they saw the world the way we wanted them to. I do know that their targeting tool was considered a weapon. There is a possibility that the American public have been experimented on. This is becoming a criminal matter. When people see the extent of the surveillance, I think they're going to be shocked. And I still fear for your life, yeah. you know, the powerful people that are involved. But I can't keep quiet just because of only powerful people. I, 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 These rights should be considered just fundamental rights. This is about the integrity of our democracy. These platforms which were created to connect us have now been weaponized. It's impossible to know what is what, because nothing is what it seems. Fake news. We don't have AIs that can detect hate speech well enough. 
we don't have AIs that can stop people from being manipulated, right? And I wish Mark Zuckerberg would just admit that. Him and Cheryl could just say, you know what? We do not have an answer to the problem. And guess what? We are asking everyone to give us some time and patience and help us even. We're going to put out some, some bids, some RFPs, for people to help us solve this problem. Because it is a massive problem. And by pretending like this is a free speech issue, Facebook is sweeping under the carpet everything from voter suppression to genocide, which they have helped cause over the past few years. And I will not be quiet about what they have done, because they have been openly complicit in that, without actually making the investment in solving the problems. Now, I think what Jack Dorsey is saying is, we do not have a current technology solution to these problems. And you know what? The downside is so bad that we are going to temporarily ban political advertising while we try and fix the problem. I don't think Jack is saying that it's much better than an oil and gas company can advertise to us than Donald Trump. But he's saying, actually, right now, there's a much bit bigger risk in the Trump, with the Trump campaign talking to you than Exxon. And that's a big stink, actually. Although I totally agree with him, given the next 12 months is a show of whether the current dictator that we have in place being able to continue to enforce his power or not. I mean, no ads doesn't mean that there's any lack of manipulation. There's still bots, crawlers, spiders, all sorts of other tools Absolutely. for manipulation. So would you say that Twitter is still just as much of a threat to our democracy? Or since it's an open garden versus a wall garden, at least there's transparency and discipline. So, so uh, Twitter, in the, in the same way that Facebook does, they still have kind of community standards where there are certain things that you can and you cannot do. And if you don't adhere to those standards, then you will either have your content removed or you will be banned temporarily or permanently. There are still a set of rules that you follow. And Twitter has politicians in that same set of rules as the rest of us. Facebook has decided that politicians are in another league because everything that they say is newsworthy, and it's better for a politician to say everything that should ever come out of their mouth, and it's an option for all of us <coughs> as citizens to then judge them. But you know what the data says? The data says that if a politician comes out with a message of hate, that incites violence with a message of disinformation, that can reach millions and millions and millions of people before community standards can really catch up with it. So, so how do we say that that's right or fair? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if we're saying that the bounty's on it. And get all geeky with it. Absolutely. Um, and why shouldn't we be doing that? Decentralization. Why shouldn't we be doing that? And that's yeah. why I absolutely say, like, like, just admit that there is a problem and ask for help. Put out RFPs and bids for other people to help you. You can't solve the problem internally, but you're telling me with five hundred billion dollars. You cannot solve the problem internally. Or I, buy a nice dress shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've worked with I've worked with the International Criminal Court on data-driven solutions to identifying misinformation and hate speech. Guess what? The ICC and the Hague solves these problems with five unpaid interns, literally, that are sitting there trying to identify hate speech. And guess what? They are able to do it. And Mark Zuckerberg goes on television and says, we have no ability to measure hate speech. That's because you haven't invested in it, my friend. Yes. Exactly. Well, OK, we'll get to Q&A in a moment, ladies. Um, so I think we're all just sort of hoping that there's going to be a moment where he says shenanigans. Um, because I felt that way about our democracy this last year, too. But um, you know, I, I think a lot of us in this room are concerned about the election coming up. As it should be. Yes. So are you worried? And yes. why? And what specifically has you worried other than, you know, I don't know, the last 30 minutes of conversation? Um, what what do you think is likely to happen? Are you worried about, you know, voting booths getting hacked? Are you worried about the process that leads us to the booths? All of the above? All all of the above. Um, I think Right now, we have 
multi-layered situation, which is that number one, on the educational level, most of us are not digitally literate. We do not know how much data we are giving away on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't know how vulnerable our daily activities make us to manipulation. And we don't actually know how to spot disinformation or media literacy besides digital literacy is quite low as well as a population. Um, so that, that's on the educational front. Now, if we talk about the legal and policy front, we have not passed the amount of laws that we need to in order to legally protect ourselves and have recourse against bad actors in elections. A lot of our Federal Election Commission regulations are fantastic, but they are not enforceable on digital platforms. Otherwise, there would be a lot of people from big tech companies that would have either bigger fines or jail time. And I'm saying that very honestly. The next, besides education and law and policy, is technology. So if we're talking about technology, we've got a lot of great cybersecurity solutions. We've got a lot of great new blockchain companies that are growing to enterprise level. And I really, truly... Really Graceful browser. Absolutely. Mozilla Foundation. Absolutely. Electronic Freedom Foundation. There's a lot of people that have been working on this for a long time. Absolutely. There's a lot of organizations and companies that have been working on technology platforms that protect us and provide tracking and traceability or lack thereof, depending on which way you want to go. Radical transparency versus privacy. It's on either end of the scale. And sometimes blockchain solutions provide you with both, which is why I'm so into this industry. Uh, but I think on a, on a technology level, we are not at enterprise adoption in the way that we need to be before next November to actually understand how our data is used, how it's abused, what we're being targeted with, track and trace where money is coming from, that pays for the use cases of our data and pays to put advertisements in front of us on our screens on, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So we are, we are wholly unprepared to protect ourselves ahead of November 2020. And I think it's actually going to be a lot worse than um, November 2016. And I hate saying that, but um, I, it, I would be lying to myself if I said anything different. Whew. Well, that was a downer. So, I mean, but I, I, I appreciate That's coming I, from an optimist. I appreciate what you're saying as an way, optimist and as someone yeah. who's near and dear to the data industry as mine. Um, we've both been in that same sort of room where we're asked to get information and I've been on the, both sides of it and that's why I'm a privacy advocate now. Yeah. Um, but I as an optimist have to believe that there are good people working on this. So yes. you just mentioned Brave and a few other good companies. Who do you think right now is doing it right? Who actually cares is ethically handling data? What companies in enterprise or even startups do you think that should be highlighted? Um, because we're not all about the problems here, we're also about solutions. Absolutely. So who do you think is the example to follow? Who's the one to be? Microsoft right now, if you're talking about big tech, uh, Microsoft is making the ethical decision on almost everything that I've seen. Um, I know, it's weird. I hated it's them amazing. in college. I was like, it's I was amazing. all about, and like, the they blow my mind all every about day. Apple, but now I well, Tim, Tim Cook came out almost a year ago and said that he thought everyone should own their data, and then my iPhone continues to stream to thousands of companies all my personal data minute to minute. So, like, get thought leadership conceptual down to implementation is very different, obviously. And I'm not saying that Microsoft has all of their back end buttoned up, not at all. But they are really investing in the solutions that are going to make a change. They're investing in massive digital literacy programs around the world. They're investing in transparency. <coughs> also investing in blockchain, not as much as some other big tech companies, but still, they're, they're getting there. And it, it it's really interesting to see them being involved in ev almost every single kind of ethical or social impact tech project that I've seen recently, where it's already becoming mass adopted and is already incredibly impressive as Microsoft as a partner or a builder or a whole 
And I, I, I think that's really impressive and really exciting. I'm not going to take that away from a lot of the the other companies that are in kind of like the big tech upper echelon. Obviously, like Google has its bad departments and it has its good departments. They have probably invested more money in policing disinformation than any other company in the world. And we really have to we really have to recognize that. Although they are the arbiter of such, um, they are right, also they're like controlling the, the search results more and more by the day and have their tentacles in the really everything. But that's, that's the reason why they have the money to invest in this, and I wish that Facebook could follow their example. You've made your money off of being a kleptocrat. Okay, so how about you give back to the people? And I, I think that Google's making an attempt to do that. I do see that. And I do see them trying to mend the loopholes that they've created themselves, and I think that's very honorable. And I do think they have a full intention to actually solve the problem because they're now as in a situation where nothing can hurt them if they decide to completely change their business model. They're still going to be here in 50 years. It's not a problem in my opinion. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think we only need to look to big tech companies. I obviously think that there's a lot of companies in this room that are representative of making the ethical solution, making the transparent solution, educating the consumer on what you are or are not giving away and giving you that choice because it really is about agency like some people are always going to be very happy to share their data if they can help solve a problem or if they can monetize their own personal data which is where we really should be going if we're going to be talking about banking and banks it's great if, if people don't have very much access to financial capital financial services but if they still don't have any finances <laughs> that that's not solving a solving anything. So talking about rewarding humans for the human value that they produce every day is very important. A lot of legislators and politicians like Andrew Yang uh, are are talking about a David. I knew you were in the Yang gang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I'm not I'm not endorsing any particular politician, but I do endorse I do endorse politicians that I uh, care about data laws and care about data protection and think about technology as something that they should have as a core part of their platform. And Andrew and Elizabeth Warren are the only two that have actually out of everybody that's running for president and they're the She's got a plan. I'm sorry. Um, oh, sorry. No, please. I was going to say, so my last question for you before we open it up to this lovely group of people who I know have great questions. Um, I know that you have been quite a busy bee since you left home in Atlanta, made a movie, wrote a book, da 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 da. Um, what have you been doing? At, I know about your work in Wyoming, but, but even today, even meeting with, with politicians. So, can you kind of share with us what you're working on on the legislative side? Because ultimately, that's going to have the greatest effect on all of our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. Our greater laws, helping our politicians actually understand. If you watch the initial hearings with Senator Bird and the politicians, that was like. I wrote some of the questions. They had to go to a Cambridge Analytica person to ask the questions. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, so they don't have the knowledge or experience, and you're one of the people out there helping them gain it. So what are you working on now that you can share with us? So I, I spend every day on two different main initiatives. Um, one is data, the Digital Asset Trade Association. We're a 501c6, so we're a lobbying nonprofit. Um, I founded that last January after <coughs> I left Cambridge Analytica specifically to go support Caitlin Long in Wyoming. Hashtag on your data. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited about blockchain at the time and my CEO kept on telling me to shut up about blockchain. So I stopped talking about it to him and just joined the community and got involved with everything. And, and when I found out that in the state of Wyoming, they were introducing the first two blockchain bills that were positive for the industry. I literally quit Cambridge Analytica to go there and lobby. And I got taught by Caitlin Long how to lobby in the state congress of Wyoming. And I, I mean, I, I've lobbied all over the world in the United Nations, European Parliament, US government, and uh, foreign governments as well. But I, I had never seen state of Wyoming where every single person there, mostly, 
it's very libertarian and their, their whole beliefs are that protecting individual rights, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a regular citizen and consumer, is the most important thing. And what they were considering is not only how do we make every person in the state of Wyoming better off, but how do we make sure that entrepreneurs can build their companies while regular citizens are still protected from what those companies decide to do or, or, or not to do. And I thought the set of legislation they were putting forward was beautiful, and I've moved to Wyoming since then and helped work on uh, the 13 laws that have since been, been passed. And all the legislators there and Caitlin and the whole team from the Wyoming Blockchain Coalition have been so inspiring because they really set to define what are our digital assets, how do we have control over them. If a third party is going to manage our digital assets, what does custodianship mean? And what is a new era of ethical banking or ethical management of our digital assets or our data or our blockchain tokens? What does that look like? And the first ever crypto banking licenses that exists in the United States, it's called the, the Speedy Bank, so it's the SPDI, so the Special Purpose Depository Institutions that we passed last March. And that means that there's a whole new banking license for a new bank that only deals with digital assets. And their loyalties are fiduciary, so that means their loyalties are to their customers not to their shareholders. So when you're thinking about the ethical decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis, the business decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis, it's to make sure that you are taking care of your customers and consumers, not your shareholders. And I think that's the way that a lot of big tech needs to start to think. How are we going to protect the people who are holding their digital assets with us, not how are we going to make the most money out of these people? And if we do not start thinking like that, we're not going to solve a lot of these problems that we're talking about. And so that that whole, the, the legislative work it, it is one side, and it's not just on blockchain legislation. Um, I, I work on data protection and privacy legislation all the time. Um, you know, in California, helping, helping people become compliant ahead of the California Consumer Privacy Act is coming into enactment in January is incredibly important because we want California to do well on the CCPA. We want that to be able to be implemented without too much friction so people understand how to do that so that other states can see that privacy legislation is good and that it's possible to do without changing your business model. Then you can actually develop a trustworthy relationship with your consumers for maybe the first time in your whole business strategy, right? And that, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm testifying this Friday publicly about the new New York privacy bill, which they've just kind of reformulated and put out again publicly. And I, I continue to do this work describing what is important about data ownership, about transparency, tracking and traceability, and self-monetization of data. What are all these components and what does that mean? As well as obviously portability and the right to delete. Um, now, besides legislation, my, my second project is on digital literacy. Now, I, I was really inspired last summer when I met the former CTO of the White House, Megan Smith. She was the CTO of America under Barack Obama, and uh, she's an incredible person. And she showed me what she believed was going to be the, the new global framework, and now it is um, already for what digital intelligence means. So it's called DQ. Now IQ or EQ, it's a digital intelligence quotient. And it means how do you how are you equipped to deal with your digital life on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you protect your data rights and understand what they are? How do you understand basic cybersecurity protocols and how to protect yourself online? How do you either identify disinformation or if you're a child uh, cyberbullying and stop that? And how do you, uh, on all, also uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, act ethically on social media and in your interactions with other people anonymously or even identifying yourself? And uh, obviously, there, there's a lot more pillars and indicators within that whole data set. But it really has to do with some of those basic principles that none of us are taught. We're just given a device 
since we're little. I remember my first computer class. I was so excited. My dad had already taught me how to do all these things at home. What was but, your first computer? Uh, I'm older than you. Wow, that's a really good question. I'm older than you, so. Commodore 64. Ooh, so yeah. me, I rocked it. Yeah, my dad had a Commodore 64 in our house. Yeah. And once it got to the point where is the first Apple computer was what he put into my room. Uh, and said, like SE, probably? Yeah, exactly. Yes, it was precious. And so he, he said instead of instead of me having my 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 dad home office, I want you to play with the computer every day, and I'm going to put it in your bedroom. So that when you wake up in the morning, that's what you do. When you come home from school, that's what you do. And put it in my bedroom. And so I got to actually play with it every day and every night. And that it, it really actually became You know what? Obsession. Same for me. It went from my brother's room to my room because I was better with it. <laughs> and yes. he learned he had Atari, so I was like, to him. So, <laughs> but that's so funny. We didn't have a weird thing that I'm coming. Yeah. But um, I know these lovely people have, I mean, Martine's dying over here. I know we've got to get to our Q&A. Um, but, um, Mark, are you running it? Let's give Martine the first. She's literally put her hand up for an hour here. And, and she has an early Game Boy phone case, which is really it's awesome. It's a throwback, yes. We'll, we're, we're, we're webcasting Martine, so the, our viewers at home. Okay, Martine. Our evil overlords. You know, as I've been watching the hearings and so forth, and I've been covering it as well, I'm wondering, you know, what is the suspicion what do people think Facebook's like, move is? Are they going to profit from it? I mean, is there, is there a suspicion that there's some sort of conservative agenda? Certainly a lot of weird stuff is coming out, like them adding right line to Facebook news and they've been hiring. And there's been just a lot of reporting on conservative dinners. But I mean, like, they live here, and a lot of us know them. I, mean, I don't think that's their politics. So like, what's the suspicion? What's the motive? What are people seriously worried about, like that Facebook is behind? I'm just, on, on the surface, I just don't get it. I mean, I, I get the movie, obviously, in the cover, but if you could just explain to me, like, what the concern is, uh, not from somebody who's, like, ignorant, but, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, that's absolutely. That's the cause that people are, like, super worried. Mm -hmm. Facebook's got some bizarre conservative agenda. So can you address that? I mean, I, I don't really... Uh, seek to quantify these issues in terms of someone's back end agenda. I don't care what their agenda is. I care whether or not they're actually going to produce the results that I'm looking for, which is that I, I would hope that at minimum we can get big tech companies to obey US law. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, also, right? these, these are laws we've Conservative doesn't mean evil. No, nope, by the way. Not they're at all. They're so, nice like, Republicans. I bet them. Uh, 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 again, <laughs> uh, again, like I, I, it was easy for me to integrate into Cambridge Analytica because I come from a uh, Republican family. I think both sides of my family are Republican. I was the black sheep that grew up like so excited to go work for Howard Dean and John Kerry and Barack Obama, and my family. Is that your great rebellion? What, what was was <laughs> it? Literally was, and, and, and awesome. most of my family that were uh, military Republicans in the South living on a military base were totally confused on where I got these ideas. And uh, <laughs> so, it, you know, the conservative agenda is not really my issue, but I would absolutely say that a lot of these policy decisions do get made after meetings with the White House or White House advisors, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend like that data set doesn't exist. Uh, that exists, uh, but, but what I would say is there's, whether or not there's a political agenda, which I'm you know, that, that's not even something I'm going to try to analyze. What I'm going to say are there, there are two different things, which is one, deciding to not invest in solving the problem, which is my biggest issue. The problem is massive. The problem is, to some people, nearly unsolvable. It is so big. So the amount of money and time and staff that it will take to police disinformation and racism and voter suppression, etc. and so forth, on these platforms is so huge. It's huge. And uh, if companies decide to not take this on, they're going to save quite a lot of money. 
So I hate to say it's a financial incentive on that side, but I really wonder what else could make you decide, I do not want people to hate each other on my platform. I don't want people to be murdered off the back of uh, messaging they see in my platform. I don't want people to decide to hate politics and never vote again off the back of what they see on my platform. What else could drive that besides money? Because there's no way that there's moral or ethical standards behind that. And so if you go to the next consideration, which is, um, which is the money behind political ads, there's a lot of money behind political ads, and not in comparison at all to commercial advertising. Not at all. It pales in comparison. But if you want to say no to a couple hundred million dollars, you're probably not Mark Zuckerberg. You just going to put it that way. And, and do it. Well, there's just one thought. They did ban crypto ads. Right before they launched their own crypto project? I mean, uh, they're calling all antitrust <laughs> investigators. I mean, we're all used to a little bit of hate rate. That's not going to stop us. We're here. We're rolling. Uh, next question from Nathan with Orchid. Blockchain VPN. Orchid, yeah. All right. Whoop. You were calling out um, how the company should buy by a U.S. law. Earlier, you were also praising Microsoft pretty heavily. Um, one of the companies they acquired, GitHub, is had a lot of negative publicity recently because they're providing software to um, ICE you know, for immigration purposes and rounding up uh, potential people, people in the United States. So is it enough to support the current government and the, their current practices and by, by U.S. law? Or do you need to have even more stringent company morals, company values to really progress and to be in the right nowadays? Absolutely. So um, U U.S. law and the enforcement coming from the current administration are sometimes directly opposed to each other. Uh, it's totally different things. So. Uh, U.S. law, there are some laws that I don't agree with, but in general we have agreed by certain ethical principles as a people. And what I'm talking about is that discrimination based off of racism and sexism, hatred that incites violence, voter suppression, all these things are illegal. And I think that that needs to be uh, enforced on technology platforms and it's not. Now that all, that all comes from a moral place. I, I spent nearly 10 years uh, studying as a human rights lawyer. So trust me, what, what, what ICE is doing breaks my heart and makes me feel like we're working more for a dictatorship than, than within a democratic society. So I definitely think that the enforcement, quote unquote, of current laws is completely misinterpreted by the current administration in many ways and uh, the, the immigration laws are, are some of them. In fact, right after Trump was uh, elected, I, I moved to Mexico because <laughs> I wanted to be on the right side of said wall and, uh, <laughs> and started a technology company in Mexico where there are people that will um, work harder and smarter and not live to unethical standards in their day-to-day -day lives in order to just produce as much money as possible for their bosses and actually on a day-to-day -day basis want to do something right. And I worked on real financial inclusion projects, not Libra, real financial inclusion Mexico projects that have hundreds of people, uh, that have millions of people in Mexico and Colombia for the first time getting their first bank account and being able to pay for what them and their families consume on a day-to-day -day basis. And not using financial inclusion as a mask for stealing all of our financial data. Oh, um, <laughs> this is what the lady with the lovely necklace up front. Hi. Um, so first, I want to say just thank you for everything you have done. Um, I know as a as another woman in cybersecurity, I really really appreciate it. Um, it's it's amazing, and I know it wasn't an easy choice, um, but um, you sincerely appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I kind of want to bring my question to, you know, sometimes I get, as anyone does, gets frustrated by the current political scheme and what's going on. So yes. thinking more locally, January, the CCPA is coming to I would like your thoughts on, do you think it does enough? Um, no. If it doesn't, what doesn't it do? And then I'm not, I mean, the other part is, 
you made a comment of how we've given all of our rights away at this point. Does yes. that CCPA let us get other, do, do we get anything back with it, do you think? Or is it like, nope, but going forward, you might? Right, uh, so let, let, let's uh, address that in in two different ways. So let's let's talk first about um, whether or not you're, you're getting rights back with CCPA, and I think you absolutely are because you are now able to demand transparency to everything that companies or governments or nonprofits, anyone, uh, what they hold on you. And you now have the right to delete if you so choose, or you have the right to portability, saying I want to request my entire data set so that I can go use that somewhere else. Everything you've collected on me, I have the right to own, and I have the right to use that for my own benefit. So, so that's fantastic. And I think that gives people a lot of their rights back that have been taken away systemically for, I mean, our entire digital lives, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, and so that's that's really important to see as like a, a beacon of hope. Now, we're going to talk about whether or not CCPA actually solves a lot of these problems. My main issue is that CCPA is meant to be compliance for big tech. So CCPA only applies to companies that have an annual turnover of 25 million or above. So great, it polices big tech, that's fantastic. It doesn't police a company like Cambridge Analytica, it doesn't police the Trump campaign, it doesn't police super PACs or PACs, or issues advocacy organizations at all. 25 million and above. So, I'm testifying at the end of this week publicly in New York on New York's new privacy bill, which their addition to CCPA is that every organization, whether you're a startup, whether you're a nonprofit, political, or anything, everybody is covered by the New York privacy bill. Um, and so that that is the main differentiator between what CCPA is gonna do in January and what we could seek to do then, in my opinion. And that a lot of the work uh, that, I, that I've been doing, especially over the past few weeks, uh, with a lot of people that come to me and say, I want to be ready for CCPA. You know, there's big companies like Microsoft and Wells Fargo who have made the ethical thought leadership decision to say, we are going to apply CCPA to the entire United States. Good on you. <laughs> Good on you, Brad Smith. <laughs> awesome. Like, the CEO of Microsoft is cool. And uh, you know what, Wells Fargo, uh, I don't even know if it's public or not, but I just said it. Um, Wells Fargo is gonna do the exact same thing. And I'm sure a lot of other companies will follow suit. And if you have to apply for California, they're treating it as a federal law, basically. Uh, that's fantastic. But you know, it's really lacking in terms of enforcement in the abuses that I saw. I saw abuses by tech startups. In general, I didn't know 25 million turnover. Uh, until the Trump campaign hired us, and by the time that revenue went through, it wouldn't have been applicable. We were a tiny, there were 12 people working for that company when I started there in 2014, so um, no way to find million. Uh -huh. And 501c3s and c4s, which are PACs and super PACs and issues advocacy organizations are not held to the CCPA that they have, so that's a major issue. Now, when we're looking at rolling this out into other states, uh, that that's something that we need to think about. But we can't do that without helping people comply. Because if we're going to hold startups and nonprofits to the same standards as big tech, we need to make it basically almost free to comply. I know I've worked for nonprofits and charities nearly my whole life, <laughs> and we work on a shoestring budget, and there's no way you're going to pay for this incredible CRM and all this cybersecurity software and all these experts to be in the house on your team, absolutely not. So if we do not find ways for people to easily comply, by like people, I mean organizations, uh, then then this isn't going to be implementable on the scale that we need. Um, so I think we have Mark will give us time for one or two more questions. We have one more here from Eduardo from Italy. Hi, Bridget. Thank you so much for all you've said. It's very inspiring. And I think you open our minds to things that we deep down know, but we don't think about, and we should think more. Uh, so you have interacted recently with uh, Edward Snowden, another big whistleblower 
and amazing personality that has opened our minds also like you did more recently. So uh, I was curious to know a little bit about the work you have done with him. If you could tell us a little bit about it, of course. So uh, in, in some ways, I, I wish that I had actually worked with him. I have been informed by his people that he thinks I'm really cool. But uh, we, we actually <laughs> haven't done any work together. <laughs> Uh, we, we were we were in a lot of publicity together around Web Summit the week before last in Lisbon, which is the world's largest technology conference, and we were the two whistleblowers that were headlined. So a lot of articles were written about what Edward said and what I said, as if we spoke together, as if we coordinated. But Edward and I have never done any work together. Um, obviously, especially his current location is not convenient for me to go and see him, <laughs> uh, given my work. And uh, so, so I don't know what that's going to look like, but it, there's a big difference between what he whistle blew on and what I whistle blew on, which is he whistle blew on the public sector, so what governments do to collect our data. What governments do to collect our data is that a totally different situation than what private companies do, and that's why a lot of people talk about us together and equate our work together, because he's whistleblowing on the public sector, I'm whistleblowing on the private sector, and, you know, his his uh, description of the way that, you know, the NSA and different government entities get access to our data usually comes from the private companies that I'm whistleblowing on, and I'm saying, private companies have this unfettered access to our personal information and give back doors to governments and that's his information. I literally have no information on that. So obviously I hope that anybody that is working in this sphere to try to make sure there's more transparency and more consent and a change in the way that this industry works. I hope eventually we're able to work together but um, Ed and I have never even talked, let alone met, so uh, I, I, I'm actually kind of flattered. <laughs> well, 2020 is going to be magical for all of us. I know Larry's been very patient with waiting. Can we do the last question from Larry? First off, thank you for You guys can hear me. Okay. I can well, hear you. It's on the webcast. The webcast. It's for our friends. So, We're hawkish about the microphone. So thank you guys for being here. I think you're both really brilliant, so I appreciate that. Let's give them a hand. Um, my first computer was a Pac Bell 386. That's nice. nice. But I'm not here to brag. So um, uh, the question I have is like, how do we get this information to the masses, right? So like my mom, super cute little Asian woman, right? She's on WeChat constantly. Right, and she's like, we chat this, we chat that, we chat. I'm like, I don't even like we chat because it's all Chinese, right? But the, the question is, I'm almost like 100% sure she has a backdoor, or we chat has a backdoor to her data, our family stuff. We have iPads. We have, you know, like when I go to my my parents' house, iPads, TVs, Roku's, um, you know, several phones. I have a laptop. I have, you know, several phones, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Apps and all that stuff. Like, I'm not gonna read every EULA. Right. I don't think anyone does, right? And I'm like mid to low level DQ, yeah. <laughs> right? I care, I care about digital privacy and data privacy. I believe everyone does to a certain extent, but not everyone cares enough to do anything about right. it. Right? And exactly. so my question is, how do we, like, what's the revolution gonna look like? I guess the question is, since you're, you're at the forefront of it, right? so yeah. both of you guys are at the forefront of it. So the question is, how do we get on board? I'm on board. But how do we, like, like, quote, unquote, like, move the needle? Right. Um, so I would just quickly say that as leaders in technology, enthusiasts, and early adopters, the burden is absolutely on us to help educate our peers, our colleagues, our relatives, our grandmas, our aunts. I think that when technology is inaccessible, it becomes limiting. And so apathy is our greatest enemy in this great war. So just telling people about blockchain, helping understand what this means when you say yes to this. Those little things add up. And so if we mobilize and in a crowdsourced way help each other to learn more, then that education becomes critical to preventing another. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to go back to my kind of three-legged stool, which is it's 
education and law and technology all working together in parallel. So all of us need to become digitally literate, whether we decide to educate ourselves. I mean, a lot of us obviously in this room are above average level uh, digital intelligence DQ. Uh, so it, making sure that our friends, our family members, our children that are not are fully clued in on how to protect themselves and what are the ethical platforms and solutions to use, how to protect yourself on a day-to-day -day basis, that's so important. Now we go from education to legislation. Edu uh, legislation and policy is so important. A lot of us feel like we don't actually affect that and we don't have access to that. You know what you do? It's literally your representative's job to represent you. They work for you. You are their boss. Literally. <laughs> that is how the entire system is made up. So if you don't call your legislator, that's as if you have a staff member that you never give an assignment to. And if we don't start thinking of it that way, we're never going to be as effective as we can be. Because trust me, there are a lot of incredible legislators out there that do understand technology, do understand these problems, and are working on it every single day. But if you do not give them your support, saying, I care about what you're doing, or I want you to do more of it, then they don't have that energy, or they don't have that legal obligation. Legal obligation, remember. I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so I, I think legal obligation is like a big term. And I get really excited. <laughs> but legal obligation, put that in the representative. And then on a technology level, this is probably the biggest conversation for people in this room. If you are building ethical technology, thank you. <laughs> if you are investing in ethical technology, do more of it. And if you are choosing whether or not to use a typical platform or to branch out and use something new where the terms and conditions are favorable to your freedom and your independence and your data ownership, you know what? Use the new platform. Do it! Does that sound like a thinly veiled endorsement for Mastodon? I don't thinly veil any of my endorsements. That's true. True story. I got up there the other day and it finally my stream has non nonsense. I'm like, hey, that's not. Whoop! Decentralized awesome. social. Yeah. And I think, and I think that, here. well, no, we're not out of time. I mean, this could go on all night. I mean, this is just amazing. And like, let me just say, I've done 28 of these Crypto Mondays since January 2018, and this is by far the best one we've ever done. <laughs> and, and we've had people from Coinbase, we've had Crystal Rose, we, we've had like everyone. This, crystal is awesome. This, yeah, Crystal is, is awesome. Bronx is awesome, everyone. But this is just really mind-blowing. And, and the consequences of what Brittany and Anne are talking about are so far-reaching and so profound that, um, you know, I just kind of wish, like, uh, like Larry asked, if we could go out and, like, shake our moms or shake our sisters and brothers who, like, aren't paying attention. And if we could get critical mass on a mastodon or a sense, or a you know a blockchain-based social network, and get people the hell off of these networks. I mean, I hate to be politically incorrect, but I've explained it to a couple of people that you know I come from the ad tech market. I built the world's largest video game um, uh, content and ad platform, and I spent a couple of years at a company called QBU, which was a competitor to Cambridge Analytica. And what's surprising is that how unsurprising what happened was. I mean, if you're a marketer on Facebook and you're what's called a PMD, you have access to the entire, or you used to at least, have access to the entire social graph. And all Cambridge Analytica did was download it. But all these marketers had access to all this stuff where you could make relationships between, I mean, our company went out and said, oh, you can find out who's conservative and who's liberal, who's gay and who's straight, who, you know, based on what sports teams they like. You know, so that's scary, yeah. you know, that's scary shit, but that data is out there. That's true. And so, I mean, you know, I think if, I really hope that your work and everything you, you and other people are doing will kind of cause some sort of you know, awakening of people, you know, conservative, liberal, libertarian, whatever, just to wake the fuck up and realize that what's going on right now, and again, sorry for the politically correct thing, is really digital slavery. Okay, if you think about the old days, 
the human being was put on a platform and someone sold them, they sold them once. If you understand the way ad tech works, you are literally being bought and sold hundreds of times a day. Your data, because in today's world, you know, 200 years ago it was about your muscles and how much whatever you could live. Today it's about your digital essence. Your identity is digital. And you are being literally bought and sold and trafficked all day, every day, by these big ad platforms. And if that doesn't piss you off or upset you, or at least demand that you get some sort of cut of that or a, or a you know, a, a, a voice and yes, I want to be part of this. I mean, to me, that's kind of the next revolution The kind of, you know, people talk about getting woke. This is what you should get woke about people. To, to not make you feel uh, politically incorrect, I was once on a CNN live interview with a friend of mine in the blockchain space who called Mark Zuckerberg a data rapist. Uh, so um, if that makes you feel better or, or equal to, to that level, then... And, and one more thing, Brittany wrote this book. Um, did you bring some with you? Are you I, I, I tried. I, I literally ordered a massive box of books to hear. Yeah, we had the same problem with the wine glasses actually, so I went out and bought new wine glasses. <laughs> but, uh, but, but this is Britney's book. If, if you're talking about things that are politically correct or not, my book is called Targeted, the Cambridge Analytica Whistleblower's Inside Story of How Big Data, Trump, and Facebook Broke Democracy. Where can we get that book? <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. You can, you can either get a, a signed copy off of, my, off of my website, which is ownyourdata.foundation, or you can go to literally probably any bookstore right now. My my awesome publisher is HarperCollins, and so the, the book is everywhere in every Barnes and Noble. Uh, so it came out a couple weeks ago. So It's super cool. She actually reads it herself on Audible. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's in my She actually reads it herself, which is super, super cool. Woo! Nice. Thank you. It was one of the hardest weeks of my entire life reading that book out loud, over and over until we got it exactly right. Uh, but my heart and soul was poured into it. So if you want to know a lot more information than I even say day to day on TV, like that's, that's the vehicle. Uh, so uh, let me know if you're interested in it. I wish I had a giant pile of them here today. But uh, go to ownyourdata.foundation. That's where I'm doing all my digital literacy programming. You can at least see all of my partners, the different work that they're doing, which could be of interest to you, um, as well as our online shop, which, which funds all of our stuff, like our Own Your Data necklaces and t-shirts and, and um, my signed books. So thank you guys all for being here. Thank you for your support. Thank, Thank you for you caring. This is an amazing thing. Thank you for caring. Thank you. Amazing. So, uh